Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I am uh, Eve Engler. Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a critical look at Canada's role abroad. It's been going on for about, uh, about two years. And um, uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Georgiage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as uh, Montreal. And uh, there's lots going on in the world. Um, so I'm gonna get right to it. Hope everyone is uh, enjoying this uh, long uh, weekend. Um, so a couple days ago, a new Canadian High Commissioner in Rwanda presented their credentials to uh, Paul Kagame. And um, no comment uh, by any in the media, from what I can tell, except the Canada Files uh, mentioned it. And uh, more than a million people have been displaced in Eastern Congo because of Rwanda's intervention there. And uh, it's just business as usual with the uh, Kagame regime uh, by the Canadian government. So uh, multiple images of Canadian troops in front of the embassy in port au prince uh, uh, outside of the gates, on top of the roof. There's been a whole bunch of media outlets have uh, shown uh, images of that. Uh, so there's definitely Canadian troops on the ground in Haiti. The Also this week, a couple of days ago, it was announced that <clears throat> 70 Canadian troops were dispatched to uh, Jamaica to train uh, forces from the Caribbean that will be uh, uh, sent to Haiti. And that's part of the money that Canada announced, $100 million or so, uh, for this uh, mission to, uh, to Haiti. Um, so Canada continues to be you know, heavily involved militarily. Uh, in in uh, in Haiti, the the um, Canadian embassy in Quito has seen at least two demonstrations in the past month. <clears throat> uh, image mining watch showed looked like there was hundreds of people uh, in front of the Canadian embassy criticizing uh, mining policy in the country, and apparently there was one uh, a few weeks uh, earlier, and. Um, uh, they're 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 condemning the criminalization of um, of anti mining protest, and they very much see the Canadian embassy as part of this whole uh, process that the government there is uh, pursuing. Canada is the largest foreign investor in Ecuador, two point six billion, primarily in mining, according to a uh, recent um, uh, Hill Times story. And the Hill Times story talked about how Canada is negotiating a trade agreement with Ecuador and is specifically um, trying to have an investor state dispute settlement process, something that's become very controversial, which basically gives companies the ability to sue uh, governments in international tribunal and would be really, in this case, all about protecting Canadian mining uh, interests in the country. And they quote uh, somebody saying, basically saying that, uh, that the Canadian government is taking advantage of the political situation in Ecuador where you have a, a pro-foreign investment uh, government, right-wing government in place to get this uh, uh, agreement through. He says, quote, we have an awkward situation where the previous governments in Ecuador have been very much against investor state dispute mechanisms. But now we have a new government that is in favor and the political situation is somewhat turbulent right now. A cynic might say that Canada is trying to take advantage of that situation. So get this investor state dispute settlement through while there's this um, uh, compliant uh, government uh, in, in place. So again, clearly indigenous people in Ecuador, anti-mining forces, see the Canadian embassy as part of this pro-extractivist policy uh, that they, they, of course, are, are rejecting. The Globe and Mail uh, had a story about uh, Barrick, says titled Barrick Settles Lawsuit with Tanzanian Villagers who alleged, who alleged Security Abuses Near Mine. So huge, big settlement. This is the second one. There was one, I think it was like six years ago, eight years ago, the story mentions. Um, uh, basically, people who've been, family members who've been killed by the police that Barrick hires at the North Mara Mine. 
And there's been tens and tens of people killed. It's something in the range of 100 over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, that uh, they got a, they got some compensation uh, from Barrick. Finally, uh, at, there was a previous settlement. In this story, um, they they remind us, and I knew they reported on this a few years ago, but I'd forgotten about it. That the, the Barrick's um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Their uh, their uh, in-house con uh, company, Acacia their domestic uh, barrack, there's a better term for it than that, um, that they paid uh, $12 million in um, uh, annually to a group of Tanzanian government officials. Uh, basically, they bribed government Tanzanian government officials for their, um, their, uh, uh, to, to advance their, their, their interests as late as 2015. This is all proven as late as 2015. They had paid this large sums of money to uh, to bribe Tanzanian uh, uh, officials. This North Mara mine is a disaster. I mean, we're talking about like huge numbers killed, uh, all kinds of abuses, uh, corruption, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it continues to go on. And as I mentioned, as I've written about previously in 2017, the um, the Canadian uh, High Commissioner organized this big meeting with the between the head of Barrick and the president of the country uh, to uh, to smooth smooth over a dispute between the the, uh, the government and the Canadian mining company. The ombudsperson that was again we've been over this in previous sessions set up to to rein in this massive Canadian abuse of Canadian mining in industry globally. And, uh, and that ultimately was watered down to this sort of toothless uh, advisory position to the industry minister. Uh, the ombudsperson, they, uh, they released a, um, a statement uh, accusing um, a Vancouver-based Dynasty Gold Corporation that it allowed a forced labor at its gold mine in, in, in the Xinjiang region of China. Now, the company says it actually had lost control of the firm, of the project before all the alleged abuse happens. So they like lost control of the firm back in like 2008 and the abuses are, are claimed after. And the ombudsperson admits that they lost control, but says that because they still had a stake in the company, they were responsible for, for um, uh, um, what took place. But basically, what's happened here with this ombudsperson is it's been turned into a tool to go after China. And, and I, as I've mentioned in previous sessions, it's a really remarkable exercise where this social movements were campaigning for two decades to have a ombudsperson to rein in Canadian mining companies. The government, the liberal government, expanded the mandate beyond the mining sector, which sort of sounds okay, brought in some other corporate sectors, but in practice was about diluting the, the focus on uh, this particularly damaging Canadian industry. And it was not just that the companies are damaging, but that they have significant state-backed support. And then um, watered down the ombudsperson so they can't actually end public support for companies found to be responsible for major abuses. They can only ask the minister to, to, uh, to do that. Um, but now it's gone even further and now it's basically become this sort of geopolitical tool. It's been essentially hijacked by these, by these um, anti-China uh, so-called human rights groups that, that are using it again, just as part of this demonized China kind of uh, uh, project. And it's got to the point, again, this is a company that says, which the ombudsperson admits, hasn't had control of the mine since 2008. Uh, they're claiming, I doubt I doubt this is true, but there, there's this like forced labor, Xinjiang forced labor, or, or Uyghur forced labor being being employed. And um, and so therefore they they are they are responsible. Um it's uh it's a pretty uh, grim story, to be honest with you, how this ombudsperson is. Taken on this whole new 
direction, but that's that is what it is. On the China file, the Foreign Interference Commission uh, resumed the the commissioner. Uh, the head said that Canada's adversaries will be um, uh, will be uh, following this and um, watching the inquiry closely and uh, uh, see what they can get away with. That's all the that's all the thinking. The ethos has just moved further and further down this idea. It's this the 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 bad Chinese first and foremost, uh, the bad Russians, the bad Iranians, and a little bit about this bad Indians. Uh, interfering in, in Canada. And they're really pumping it hard and a whole bunch of stories, front page of the Globe, Globe Mail, multiple days. Then they published a piece about diaspora groups tell inquiry of foreign intimidation efforts. So they quote the uh, the head of the Uyghur group, uh, Mati, uh, or Tati, should I say, um, just repeating this, this, you know, he's, he's so scared, the Chinese are coming after him and He's he's under threat and just a just a sort of constant drumbeat of this kind of angle. Now, the a number of uh, uh, Chinese Canadian uh, uh, groups and individuals uh, that put out a different perspective than this one that goes aligns with the U.S. Empire perspective about um, this being this inquiry being uh, um, you know needed and and that it's that it's. Uh, all these groups are being targeted by China. Um, they put out a statement and they said that the the uh, uh, the 1885 Royal Commission on Chinese Immigration ended not well for the Chinese community. We're afraid this inquiry will result in similarly exclusionary policies. Um, that got very little attention. So they're basically a bunch of Chinese Canadians saying that this inquiry is actually designed or it's designed and or feeding their exclusion from political, uh, even even scientific, academic kind of kind of life. And there's a lot of evidence suggests that's happening. And it's making many, many Chinese Canadians feel they don't have the right to at least speak up. Uh, and and even worse, uh, in, in some instances, that this inquiry is just feeding that. And of course, it's not front page of the Globe Mail. Um, but the 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 claims that the the uh, the uh, um, the groups opposed to the Chinese government make uh, that appears on the front page. Uh, on the China issue, the there's a couple of stories. Canadian uh, um, trade uh, minister was in um, in Vietnam. And uh, they talk about Canada's bid to deepen economic relations with Vietnam explicitly as a way to decouple from China. Uh, it appears that the Vietnamese government's not really on board for this. The Vietnamese government is trying to take this very independent path and you know trade with whoever. And apparently, actually, Canadian companies, according to one story, have significant have been doing significant business in Vietnam for, for many decades now. Um, one globe story details all the Canadian companies operating there and a bunch of them who were part of this trade mission uh, to, to Vietnam. Uh, but they, the liberal government is framing its deepening ties with Vietnam as part of this competition with, with, uh, with, uh, with China. The, the uh, 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 Hill Times uh, republished in, um, uh, by Peace Quest, published a story titled Will Trudeau choose war or peace in his upcoming budget? And it's looking increasingly like they're going to try to invest more in the military. The, the Globe um, published a couple pieces about one of, on the front page, high price tag of equipment driving delays in defense policy update. Basically, the liberal government's realizing just the incredible sums that are, that are going to these the naval vessels, fighter jets, submarines, etc., that they're that they're uh, planning and purchasing, and they're getting sticker shock, and they they don't know what to do with this defense policy uh, up, update, alongside, of course, all this added pressure about hitting the two percent of of GDP NATO target, and and so they're um, they don't know what to do, and they're basically postponing the defense policy update. 
And as the Globe editorials claimed, the dithering on defense is indefensible. So they're feeling a lot of heat, uh, but they don't know what to do. Now, in the context of this sort of the military and the place of in the, within the media, TVO, uh, uh, Pakin, the show with the, uh, I don't know what the show's called, but I think it's Steve Pakin, prominent journalist on TVO, uh, TV Ontario. He had this uh, panel discussing uh, military affairs. And as Puglesi pointed out, he had a retired general who was with the Conference of Defense Associations, which is the Canadian military funded um, body that goes back almost a century. Uh, and it was basically set up by the military and continues to get most of its funding from the military. He had a prof from the Royal Military College, which is, of course, run by the Department of National Defense. And he had Kerry Buck, who's the former Canada's former ambassador to NATO, who's also with the Conference of Defense Associations. Defense Association. So this panel of three people is all the people with like deep military ties. That's the only perspective you get. Even at the liberal kind of end of TVO um, uh, in on uh, on uh, on military affairs, today is the hundredth anniversary of the um, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force establishment, nineteen twenty four. Now it was sort of set up actually. There was sort of a nascent Canadian Air Force set up in England during World War One, uh, but. It was formally established in 1924. That was then disbanded and, and established in 24. And online, there's, there was some stories on the weekend in the Globe uh, about the 100th anniversary. And I'm presuming you're going to see some more. Uh, I haven't read today's papers because the library is not open. And and uh, and uh, but but presumably in today's papers and, and coming days there'll be more stories. But online, all of the uh, ministers. Uh, different accounts of the Canadian government are all talking about the 100th anniversary. And it's all like defending Canada and this and that. Now, uh, the military or the Air Force, should I say, uh, has a, has, was openly racist for its first 30 or 40 years, right? Restricted to people of European descent into the mid 1950s. That was like on paper. During World War II, they allowed like non, they allowed uh, black people and, and what they called Orientals, um, uh, to to do like menial tasks, but never to fly planes and stuff like that. And uh, and that continued after World War II. Um, they have uh, in engagement. The, the 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 initial the the sort of nascent Air Force actually was even involved in sort of spying on the Winnipeg General Strike before its formal creation and, and some other stuff like that. Still, you know, re reflect like elitist uh, uh, corporate kind of uh, 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 worldview. Um, the military, the Air Force also uh, played a role in bombing during World War II and reestablishing British colonies in Asia and Africa. Uh, it had nuclear weapons stationed, there, the fighter jet stationed in Europe after World War II uh, had nuclear weapons, American nuclear weapons. Uh, they, the, the Air Force basically subverted the government of Diefenbaker and previous uh, by establishing ties to the American Air Force in the early 50s to basically force the hand of the government to accept NORAD. NORAD, of course, gave U.S. Uh, generals the, the um, right to deploy Canadian uh, fighter jets, right? That was established in 58. But, but the whole, this whole subverting of Canadian uh, political control over the over the Air Force, that process began earlier, and the Air Force played this role in trying to basically force the Diefenbaker government into accepting NORAD and the the uh, the implications that come with NORAD. And um, and then of course, most importantly, the Canadian Air Force has bombed Iraq in the early '90s, Yugoslavia in the late '90s. Uh, Libya in 2011 with the Canadian general overseeing that bombing campaign. So this whole business of the Canadian Air Force just being this defensive uh, arrangement is, is, of course, nonsense. But that's the kind of stuff we, we, we will hear in our, in our media uh, over the next uh, uh, few days. Um, 
There's a story about uh, Honka in the Maple, the SS veteran in Parliament scandal, receives a award named after Nazi collaborator. So Ukraine gave uh, gave Honka um, an award. Uh, there's an, uh, an, it's another story uh, or online, a tweet uh, thing that's pretty hilarious. Uh, a Canadian government t- Twitter account has this whole thing, this whole thing on disinformation. And uh, it's, it goes, is disinformation effective? In episode one of our series, Democracy and Disinformation, Marcus Kolga explains how dis- disinformation can affect more than our social media feeds. And so that Marcus Kolga, who's this whole so-called disinformation expert funded by the American government. Uh, And uh, Kolga, basically, disinformation begins with with, uh, Lenin and Stalin. And according to this clip, a Canadian uh, Twitter account. And uh, and of course, Putin, it's Putin. So it's all, all, according to this guy, disinformation is just basically a Russian thing. It's got a long history and it's coming for us. And and this Kolga is just like he's just a total neocon, right? There's a hard line militarist um, who, of course, is engaged in widespread uh, disinformation himself. And he's the one um, being uh, put forward by the Canadian government as this great disinformation expert. Gives you a little hint at where this whole disinformation uh terminology and brouhaha, what it's designed to do, which is just to cow people into supporting NATO uh, perspective. Uh, Rick Hillier, the former head of the uh, Conference of Defense Associations, uh, sorry, the, uh, not Conference of Defense Associations, uh, chief of the defense staff, the head of the military, he, he blocked me on Twitter, which I thought was kind of funny. And I don't know why he blocked me. I don't really remember. He's gone. He seems to have gone crazy in in Israel stuff. I don't actually even remember engaging with him. Um, but one of the things I'm seeing, just like online, there's just more and more people uh, accusing me of being funded by Russia, Iran, China, Hamas. Uh, uh, it's actually pretty intense how much of this you're seeing pop up from from um, um, just kind of random individuals. But some of it, of course, is also a bit more like uh, people like Warren Kinsella, who who writes in the Toronto Sun. He's written a bunch of pieces about all these demonstrations, the Palestine demonstrations. They're all being funded. And uh, it's a pretty uh, um, fascinating dynamic to see. It's not new, of course. You know, people were saying that back in the early, two, after the 2004 coup, and people claiming that Aristide was uh was paying me and um but but the the extent of it seems to have really really ratcheted up um now shifting gears to this to the big uh issue of the day the as people probably have seen israel uh, blew up the uh, embassy in uh, iranian embassy in damascus and they killed the top uh, iranian general is the claim I think that's I'm not I'm not sure it's 100% confirmed at this point but but it seems to be that that's the case. And I think they killed they killed multiple other people. And a couple of days ago they killed about 40 people I think it was in in Syria and they've been obviously bombing Syria regularly on a weekly basis for the last multiple years but it's clearly picking up. And this what happened today is a big step up. Also the the their their bombing in in Lebanon is picking up too. And they've killed, I think, over 240 Hezbollah fighters in the past uh, five or six months. And they're blowing up more and more stuff further, deeper and deeper into Lebanon. The, the, I, I'm, I'm expecting a serious response from Iran. Iran has already said they're going to respond. I, I think we are. I think we potentially are walking down a path to something pretty, pretty wild. Uh, I, I Clearly, the, the Israelis want to suck Americans into a war with Iran. I think that's their objective here. Uh, and I don't know that Biden necessarily wants that, um, but he's not doing what's necessary to rein Israel in to, to stop that. And we've got to remember that there are a significant number of Russian troops in Syria. And these bombings do run up against 
Russian interests to an extent. I know Russia and Israel has have kind of come up with an agreement around Israel's ability to bomb in Syria, but at some point that's going to come, uh, you know, that's going to that's going to not no longer uh, hold. And the the fact that Russians are claiming the Ukrainians did were responsible for the the um, the concert hall uh, attack a massacre, uh, and I don't I don't think that that I'm not sure that's true, but that the fact that the Russian government is saying as much and is trying to blame Ukraine, and the fact the Russian government is now saying it's at war with Ukraine. Uh, which I think is a message to NATO, the U.S. principally, um, we're walking down a path here of like, you know, World War III is not, uh, it, it doesn't have to start actually in Ukraine. You could argue it's sort of already going this low level, obviously low level, you know, proxy war. But but Israel keeps ratcheting up in Syria, attacking Iran, Iran attacks, Russia gets, gets sucked into uh, defending Syria, fighting uh, Israel and the U.S. gets. I mean, you can see this play this play out, right? Obviously, we hope this doesn't go. This doesn't happen. Obviously, um, I think it's still remote. But this is this is real. This is you know this is this possibility is going up uh, on a day day by day basis. Um, Israel has to just simply be reined in. I mean, it's just a totally out of control rogue state. Uh, that just 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 thirty minutes ago, uh, listen, Al Jazeera, they just killed another five aid workers. Uh, all the stuff's going on Al Shifa. Uh, they still they, they're clearly setting up to go at Rafa. I mean, this is just total insanity, and the um, possibility of 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 uh, of escalation of drawing in other countries, other military forces, just seems to go up. Um, the motion in the House of Commons, there's some more fallout, more stories about that. There's some fascinating elements. The Globe had a front page piece titled Liberals Race to Secure Concessions from NDP as Gaza, Gaza Motion Threatened to Reveal Deep Party Divisions. Now, what this piece claims, and based upon, it says, multiple uh, liberal sources, that more than several, more than 70 liberal MPs had told the WHIP's office that they would vote with the original version of the motion. Several sources said the government expected that number to keep rising to between 80 and 90. So there's there seems to have been a, like a very, very slight chance that the NDP motion could have even passed. I'm not sure of the exact numbers of MPs, but it was getting right towards the threshold of actually even passing. Um, and basically, the liberal backbench had had, had support, or supporting it. The cabinet was obviously all forced to not, uh, they were forced to, to vote uh, collectively and not to back the NDP motion. But there was, there was apparently almost all of the backbench was, was, was on board. And that's why they were so panicked for this late night negotiation where they watered it down. They su successfully watered it down, but there still are some things in there that were, you know, some steps forward and 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 undoubtedly, the whole overarching ethos uh, is one of blaming uh, Israel and and calling for uh, pressure uh, to be brought to bear on Israel. Um, uh, the the uh, Globe Ibbotson had a piece titled Get "Canada's Domestic Politics on the Israel Hamas War Are Shifting in Light of the Motion." Uh, then you on the other end, you had front page National Post Anthony Housefather crying up a storm uh, with a piece titled, this is not the, not the Canada I love and house father whining about uh, uh, how the liberals abandoned him or whatever. Israeli media covered it a lot, whole bunch of stories uh, in, in, in right-wing Israeli media uh, complaining about it. They were really boasting. They were like, Israel does not need Canada. Canada needs Israel. And this one story and a number of them that said basically making the same line, and this one story says, Israeli innovation and Israeli inventions, Israeli ingenuity and Israeli integrity. Right now, I pity this, this, this some 400,000 Jews still living in Canada. So this Israel is so great. So we're such, you know, tech and we're so morally righteous. And 
uh, you know, Canada's whatever. Um, and then there were a whole bunch of stories also making the line, Canada more dependent on Israeli arms than vice versa. So, so uh, Tristan Hopper at the National Post had one of those stories making that claim. And only like six weeks ago, as uh, uh, Alex Kosh at the Maple pointed out, that um, only a few weeks ago, mid-February, he was publishing something saying that uh, uh, why Canada is not arming Israel. Uh, no military aid whatsoever. Uh, so basically, so this is how that whole discussion about arms, Canada arming Israel, how, how it's flowed. They were all denying it. Canada wasn't selling weapons to Israel. That was the official story of the Liberal government and much of the media that bothered was kind of like purveying that. And then they flip it back the other way and like, oh, well, Israel's, Israel's uh, you know, uh, Canada's going to be more hurt uh, by the weapons uh, ban than, than Israel because we, we import more than we, we export. So they're now like this, this sort of backpassing emission, backhanded emission um, uh, of, of that Canada's arming, selling weapons to Israel. <clears throat> but the, of course, as uh, Alex Kosh and others uh, pointed out that that this is, you know, the arms thing is they're, they're trying giving themselves all this wiggle room. They're going to try to continue selling weapons. The interesting, so obviously the Israel lobby, American empire, whatever shapes the, the question of, 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 of arms permits to Israel. But another force that we need to not lose sight of is the Canadian Association of Defense and Securities Industries, the lobby group of Canada's arms manufacturers. And they weighed in basically complaining uh, about uh, uh, this, this uh, lack of clarity around arms permits to Israel. And, and obviously they are at a minimum uh, behind the scenes lobbying to continue to be able to sell whatever weapons they, they want to sell uh, to, to, uh, to Israel. Um, there was a piece in uh, 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 Mastriche, in, uh, in the Maypole about Kotler. Okay, so he did that big, long, maybe it was two pieces a while ago, six, eight months, a year ago, maybe, uh, about how Kotler wasn't Mandela's lawyer, a very powerful piece, but he's got a follow-up. And and he goes at it, he goes at, again, he, you know, more details on how Kotler wasn't Mandela's lawyer and he's lying. But, but apparently Kotler's even lying about the fact that he was arrested. When he, he, the story is he gave a speech, like a anti-South African apartheid speech while he was in South Africa in 1981. And apparently it doesn't, there's no evidence he actually ever was arrested. And, and uh, uh, Dugard, the, the lawyer that, that uh, is supposed to have uh, brought him in to speak at uh, one of the South African universities at the time, he's, he doesn't remember it. And uh, David Mastriche, David Mastriche goes to, Talks a whole bunch of the figures that that should be know the details on all this. Everyone's denying all across the board. All the South Africans are denying. No evidence he was a lawyer. No evidence he was arrested. It appears he even got the year wrong. He was actually it only looks like he was actually there in 1982, but he's claiming he was arrested in 1981. Um, so the story is worth worth reading. It just, I mean, like, I mean, it seems like Kotler has now been caught in a pretty big lie. And they, he's going to keep going. They're going to keep, the mainstream is going to keep defining him as Mandela's lawyer, probably. But the basis of this now seems incredibly, incredibly weak. And uh, it's, it, it, honestly, it's quite an indictment of the whole uh, Zionist movement. Because they, Kotler is held up as this great moral da-da-da-da-da. And um, this, how he's used this business of uh, he claiming that Mandela would have been against South Africa taking uh, uh, Israel to the International Court of Justice, um, all this kind of stuff that he's doing. He's like him and Mandela were like great buddies, and he knows <laughs> he knows Mandela's opinion about Palestinians better than all the all the South African comrades that like fought. I mean, it's just all such a joke. But this is this is this is Kotler. This is our media. Um, but but bravo to Mastriche for for a very deep dive, very deep, uh, serious, serious research uh, uh, project. It's very embarrassing for Kotler, for the Canadian media, 
uh, for um, the Zionist movement. Um, Electronic Intifada, there's this 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 false this this dubious uh, Israeli commission into the uh, sexual assault, the rape claims for October seventh, and Kotler is sits on the board of this 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 um, entity uh, that's been this main person who claims that she oversees commission. It's just been caught lying repeatedly, and Kotler's on on uh, is given his name to this this uh, uh, affair. Um, another example of Kotler and his uh, his dubious uh, 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 claims and and associations and etc. The National Post, the Financial Post, published the piece by Howard Levitt, this lawyer. Toronto lawyer, this corporate uh, employment lawyer. So he's had a column in the business section of the National Post for like years. Okay, it's supposed to be about like how employers can fire people and you know what employers have to you know just uh, um, labor law uh, from a very you know pro corporate perspective. Um, and that's the point. This is in business section. You know, presumably it's business types reading it to you know. Keep up to date on on labor law. Now, over the past six months, it's turned into uh, just you know how to justify killing Palestinians. Really, now much of it early on was framed from the from a, like a like a, a labor law perspective. Now it's just gone off into just nothing to do with labor law. Really, it's just like he's got the thousand word platform in the business section, and he's just going to you know, justify Israel killing people and and how um, every, everyone protesting that is an anti-Semite. And so this latest piece is titled Canadian Jews are once again in the crosshairs of cancel. Sorry, sorry, I missed that wrong one. The social compact with Canadian Jews is being be, is being broken. So this is in the business section, the financial post like almost nothing to do with business affairs. And in this piece, he says, it is not just Jews who are under attack. Our entire civilization is threatened. Okay, by again, by people protesting Israel's responsibility for a Holocaust in Gaza. Now, Howard Levitt, how, what he's done over the past six months, I, 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 it has to be stated that what's the important part of this is the the position of Canadian Jewry, their overrepresentation in positions of influence, which is a statistical fact, and if you bring it up, it will you will be accused of being uh, anti-Semitic for bringing it up. But it is absolutely statistical fact. It can only be brought up from pro-Zionist forces when they frame it in a positive light. Uh, but when you when you frame it in a when you bring it up in a in a critical lens of you know how big a deal anti-Semitism is, for instance. Then it's then it's uh, you you know you get you get hit very hard, including by um, by self declared pro Palestinian uh, 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 members of the Jewish community, and, and not just Jewish community, but more broadly sometimes. Howard Levitt using this platform that he has as this corporate lawyer to just be basically in the Financial Post, just week after week, spew these anti Palestinian. Uh, diatribes. It to me is just a is a, is a really clear example of the fact that part of the dynamic, as much as it makes uncomfortable, make people uncomfortable to talk about it, a dynamic and understanding Canada's anti-Palestinian positions is simply that the Jewish community, which is not obviously large segments or not, but predominantly uh, pro-Zionist, they're using their influence in these platforms to basically create an environment of extreme anti-Palestinian uh, positions. And Howard Levitt, to me, is an extreme example. There is no way in the world, this is a total uh, aberration in the financial post to have these, these columns that have nothing to do with anything business affairs. Um, uh, the social compact with Canadian Jews is being broken. Now, another example of that is in the Toronto Star from, from a slightly different direction is um, Michael Levitt, the head of the Friends of Simon and Weisendahl Center. And he has a piece titled, Canadian Jews are once again in the crosshairs of cancel culture. 
And he says, quote, it is fair to say Jews are the world's most canceled people. Long before anyone spoke of cancel culture, Jews learned the hard way what it is to be shut down and silenced by hate-driven ostr ostracism, harassment, threats, baseless allegations, historical revisionism, and belligerent ideology. So this is in the liberal Toronto Star, just publishing this complete and utter nonsense of the fact that people opposing genocide are ostracizing Canadian Jews. I mean, it's just like out of control. And one element in understanding all this, as much again, as this may reinforce tropes, it's a reality in this case, the, the, um, the over-representation of Canadian jury in positions of influence, in this case, talking about columns in two different newspapers, that is part of explaining the political uh, uh, dynamic that we live where um, the world's upside down when it comes to uh, uh, Palestinian um, uh, uh, rights. Uh, it's not an entirely uh, Jewish phenomenon, of course. Um, the Can Jewish News had a piece about David's House of Prayer is a Christian ministry that's been helping organize pro-Israel rallies in Victoria, B.C. So uh, actual demonstrations being organized by Christian Zionist organization in, uh, in uh, B.C. This group apparently is one of these very odious kind of um, reactionary uh, evangelical uh, organizations. Um, as part of the, the anti-Palestinian ethos that's, that's been created in the, in the dominant media, on Saturday, there was a real ratcheting up of the authoritarian repression. So there's been all these ways in which demonstrations in Toronto have been attacked. But, uh, you know, you can't protest on that highway overpass because the claim is, is there's some Jewish community centers a couple hundred meters away or whatever. Um, uh, a whole series of, 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 of measures like that that have been adopted. But on Saturday, they went after the big demonstration, downtown demonstration, and they basically shut it down. The cops intervened, apparently like a couple hours into it, and it was a big demonstration. They brought in, it seems from what I can piece together, it all started with the a woman, a uh, pretty small looking woman, Arab woman, back, Arab looking woman, on the back of the sound system truck. And the police, I guess they claim, they'd said you can't have anyone on the truck when it's moving. It's moving like, like not really moving. It's just a, you know, a total snail pace. Um, they come in and they grab this woman just like, like off the back of the truck and rip her out to, to arrest her. And then, of course, this elicits uh, a huge kerfuffle and the police come in hard, the bike cops. Then they bring in um, they bring in uh, horses and multiple people get injured. Apparently people were hospitalized and even some random dude walking by just got got swept up. And you can there's images of him being taken down by the cops. Um, and so, so they, real escalation of repression. Now, apparently it's way into the demonstration, almost for sure, nothing, absolutely nothing had happened, totally peaceful, just like previous weeks, almost for certain this was all pre-planned. And it's just finally this constant drumbeat from the pro-Israel forces of, you know, ratchet up, ratchet up, you know, these odious, they're anti-Semites, they're thugs, they're Hamas mob, whatever, whatever. Police got a crap down and just been open about that for months and months and months. Finally, it got to the police and they made they made the move. And, and you see online, they're all celebrating all these uh, pro-Israel accounts, just totally celebrating this this uh, this repression uh, in Toronto. Um, so it's a big it's a big uh, escalation. I think it's very important that the pushback is big. Um, uh, we put out a, uh, an action alert. If anyone could go on my Twitter and share it in the chat. Um, uh, today, uh, JPA and CFPI uh, calling on the mayor and the deputy mayor who's on the police board to, uh, to, to uh, 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 denounce what the police did. Um, so please do sign that. Please do share that. Um, it's very important. There's a, there's a big pushback to this escalation. And um, um, I've gone on too long, but quickly to just to kind of wrap up a few other points. Uh, people probably saw the Melanie Jolie thing. So on um, Friday, 
um, a member of, I think they're called um, Montreal Fa Families for Palestine. Somebody, I don't know who they are, um, was biking with their two kids and um, he bumps into Melanie Jolie and he comes up the sidewalk. I, I have, I shared a clip that you can see it on my Twitter if you want. Uh, I cut a bit of the, the start bit, but he's got, you can see his bike. Uh, he's got a bike with him as he starts. And, uh, and he, he challenges Melanie Jolie and she not, she hits his, she hits his camera and then she sort of grabs on him. Uh, you can, you can't see, you can see her hit her camera. You can't actually even grab, but he says that. And, uh, and, uh, and so she basically loses it. So she kind of loses her cool. And then he really does a quite a good, like, like, like response to her, but she says she wants to have a nice quiet walk and you can't have a, he says you can't have a quiet walk while you're supporting genocide. And, uh, and it's a bit back and forth. Now it, it it's gone went crazy on my Twitter and a whole bunch of different Palestinian youth movement uh, accounts and the like on social media. And then the corporate media's picked it up. Journal de Montréal's published it. Uh, CTV Montreal, uh, CP twenty four, and uh, it's a it's a good it's a very successful uh, intervention. Now they're also the media is ramping up this whole line that there's there's something dangerous, and and. Uh, even though she actually had an RCMP agent with her, with her, and the RCMP agent takes a very soft, soft approach, probably because uh, the guy's got two kids with him. <laughs> he's just like a dude with a bike on his bike with two kids, and obviously he's not a threat to the minister beyond, you know, a political challenge to her, which is absolutely legitimate. Um, but the media is kind of trying to start up this, this storm. In fact, it's her that if anybody should be, you know, assaulting, it's actually the minister. And they're, they're taking up this whole line of this is a danger to democracy and all this kind of business. Um, but it's a but it's a sign of of uh, of the mobilization and, uh, and and kudos to this person. Um, in BC, there's a push to have Nakba uh, commemoration in the school curriculum. Uh, the Parti Québécois here in Quebec. Is a call that the the the, El, the Tel Aviv office that the CAC government in Quebec has opened up recently. It says it lacks openness. So starting they're starting to criticize what Quebec's doing uh, with regards to Israel. Uh, uh, Mayor Olivia Chow's iftar. There was a good um, a disruption of that in Toronto. Uh, Twenty six week, twenty seventh weekend in a row here in Montreal. Big demonstration. Obviously the one in Toronto on Saturday that was attacked. There were like thousands of one at that uh, that was attacked by the cops. Uh, the mobilization uh, uh, continues. And uh, just a quick final note is thanks to everyone who organized and came out to the book events. It's a couple uh, quite good events in Waterloo and in, in, in Hamilton. Not as good of a turnout in Toronto. Uh, good event in Ottawa last week uh, as well. And, um, and there's an event on the 20th in Kingston. Going to do one here in Montreal and then out on the West Coast in uh in mid-june um i'll leave it at that and i'll make laura a um a uh, co-host and um go ahead uh questions i think you should unmute yourself. yeah go ahead laura okay okay so i'm sorry i'm putting myself first because i have kind of a burning issue so this issue of the ndp you know and the ban on future permits for military exports I guess I'm just wondering about it because it's getting so much great airplay in the U.S., including on Democracy Now! And tomorrow, Code Pink is having its National Congress on this, bringing in two Canadians, Libby Elliott and someone else, to talk to us. And, you know, there are hundreds of people in it to talk to us about how, you know, what we can learn from the Canadians about this great initiative. And I was wondering if you think, like, does it really warrant that? Everything I'm reading now starts to make me think it's a bit of a nothing burger, maybe. I mean, I was wondering, like, these future, if, if there are current permits that could last, like, another two or three years, or, so does that mean the weapons just keep flowing for the next two or three years? Because those permits were already issued? Yes, that is how I understand it. But I, I don't think the permits work uh, like that in the sense that it's not like an open-ended permit that says you can just keep selling guns to Israel, right? It, it says... Um, you know, there's a request for uh, a thousand uh, radar bits for whatever drone, and the government says yes or no to that. 
So, so it, the, 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 the shipments would continue on almost certainly for a minimum multiple months, but probably, you know, years. I mean, we're seeing that with the Sa Saudi Arabia, you know, that that's obviously way bigger, but like that the permits were, were granted six years ago now. And those, those arms are still, are still, uh, you know, being delivered on a monthly basis and, you know, fulfilling of that, of that contract. Um, so, so that would be longer than the usual, but I, but I would, you know, be astounded if it's not at least, uh, uh, at least a year, uh, that it would play. So, so that's for sure. But also it, this, the language is a little bit vague on this, but it's even, you know, in some sense, even worse than that, the language of vague is that it's like new permits, so there's some process which there's many permits outstanding that have yet to have a yay or nay given. And, and um, those are still sort of allowed to be okayed by the government according to the language in that motion. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that, you know, that could extend the period even longer. Right. Um, so in that sense, the, the, the it, it's it's a you know world beyond war put a graph out um about uh what a real two-way arms embargo would be and they they i think it's four or five points in the graph of of what and the, and the you know the this is one step of of four or five and obviously it would be a real two-way arms embargo obviously you would not import from Israel, that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and that's not on the agenda at all. You would also, um, all permits outstanding would just be, you know, okay, nay to all permits outstanding. Also, the you would break, you would break the contract, right? You'd say, okay, there was, you, you know, whatever hasn't been fulfilled, you would say you no longer have the right to export whatever, even if we gave you that permit three months ago, you have no, no longer have the right to, to, uh, to keep exporting, that would be a, a full, uh, uh, you know, arms embargo, and that's definitely not what's on the table. I don't I have to. I, I look. I have the language. I looked at the language. What, what was in the initial uh, NDP motion? I'm not sure that the even the initial NDP motion, which was watered down substantially, that even that was a full two way arms embargo. Um, I think it it implied that you know like there would be no more weapons after today kind of thing, but, but it didn't say no Israeli, uh, no purchases from Israel. Um, but, uh, so I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say it's nothing, but I also wouldn't say it's, uh, it, you know, we should be clear that it was a very minimal, uh, uh, victory. Okay. Go ahead, Yuri. What uh, second. Thank you. Um, I wanted your thoughts, Eve, on Al Jazeera being banned from Israel. And will we see a trend of Middle Eastern based and news outlets who are critical of Zionism and give uncompromising stances on Palestine? Uh, will we see more of that being banned in Israel, as well as even Western Indy media being banned on Israel? And I have to ask this question uh, because, my, because, because I am part Congolese. Why do you think the Congolese government is not taking actions, uh, is not taking action against Rwanda's proxy forces? And and what can Canadians and others uh, do to help out uh, Julian Assange? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, I saw, I saw that this, there's this motion, the Israelis have passed the motion about banning principally uh, Al Jazeera, but I think there may be other media part of it. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, then yeah, who claimed that Al Jazeera was like responsible for October 7th or implicated in October 7th, or I, it just all seems kind of like comical, uh, um, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know, I, I remember three or four months ago, there was a whole, look like they were moving against Al Jazeera. I don't know. I don't know what this is actually going to mean. Um, I assume it would just mean that they would they would kick out the Al Jazeera reporters that are in um, in Israel proper and uh, you know in East Jerusalem uh, and, and maybe in the West Bank. 
uh, I don't think that the reporters on the ground in Gaza, I, I you know, maybe they'll try to kill them, <laughs> um, but but uh, but they wouldn't really be able to necessarily shut the the uh, Al Jazeera reporters in uh, Gaza, and they of course have they've killed family members and camera people and whatever of Al Jazeera reporters in Gaza, and not to mention, um, you know, Shireen Abu Akleh. Uh, um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, this is a fascist, like, like to me, what we're seeing, I mean, you, you, I don't not to overplay connecting these dots and stuff, but clearly the Zionist movement is, you know, it's, it's a, that is a very important element of it is just a fascist movement. And that's kind of like where we're going. To, and, you know, here too, right? Like when these, when, when these, this, these, these Zionist uh, uh, lobbyists online are just like openly celebrating the police sending in horses uh, to, to uh, bust heads at a, a peaceful demonstration in Toronto. Um, I mean, this is, this is the sort of where they're, where it's all going. Um so yeah, I mean, I don't know if Canadian media will push back with regards to Julian Assange. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously should be raised. Canadian government officials should be raising it. I know there was a there was a, um, a positive uh, court uh, order uh, or decision. Was that five days ago? A week, you know, just recently, and uh, about um, extraditing him to the U.S. and um, but. Uh, the Canadian government should be pressured to, you know, make a statement, but you know, they haven't. Um, I don't really know with regards to the Congolese government. I mean, obviously like the, the Gali has a lot of, has had a lot of influence over uh, the Congolese government over the years. I, I, I don't, I think an element of it is that the, they just don't, the, they're the, the Rwandan military is just better than the Congolese military. And so, um, the Rwandans, you know, are going to win. <laughs> and so the Congolese uh, uh, leadership is is cautious. Um, that's sort of my sense. I don't know how much of it is tied to they are also kind of like profiting off of, I know people say that. I don't know. I, I read that years ago that the, you know, um, Kabila was uh the, the son was 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 profiting off of uh Rwanda's dominance in the east of the of the country um but uh yeah okay so i think that's it Eve. unless i'm not seeing people you're actually going to get out in time today awesome <laughs> thanks everyone thanks Eve. same place same time next week Hi, all. Yeah.